I went on your web page, I was reading about you, and I think you described yourself as, let me find this, yes, a cyborg naturalist, right? Which strikes me as something of an oxymoron. I mean, aren't naturalists supposed to be armed with insect nets and things like that? What, what, what do you mean, what, what's a cyborg naturalist? How, how does that work? Uh, a cyborg naturalist is, we are living in, a, in an incredibly exciting time to be a naturalist. Because we have all these new senses that allow us to see the world in a much um, more expansive view. It, it, we have, for example, remote sensing. Remote sensing allows us to see the world at the scales at which ecological processes really take place. Right. We can use molecular tools to go into the past. We can reconstruct the history of organisms. We can, in, in some sense, time travel. Mm. I use isotopes to figure out from you know, a feather of a bird where it's m moving around. So we can use all this technology, uh, all this amazing technology to expand our senses. Just imagine what, you know, Alexander von Humboldt would have given to have a Google Earth map uh, of the Rio Negro when he was exploring this, or what Darwin would have given to have a good phylogenetic uh, tree for his, uh, evolutionary tree for his barnacles. And we can do those things now. It's, a, it's a, the most exciting time to be a naturalist these days. And also, I'm sorry, I'm talking too much, but no, there, no, there's no, this no. idea that, to, you know, naturalist, natural history is the domain of uh, Victorian aristocrats. Right. right. And uh, what is happening is that <coughs> natural history is becoming democratized. Well, and, and I mean, that was one of the promises that was made during the Enlightenment, wasn't uh, it, right? That, well, that, no. that our capacity to know would be democratized, that well, we would all is, have access. It is now, and um, there, there are a few things. For example, it used to be that to be able to identify a creature, you need either to oh. have access to a collection mm -hmm. or, you, not, or to have a lot of expensive, wonderfully, beautifully illustrated Street books. Text. All you need now is, a, is an iPhone. <laughs> right. And you can take a photograph, access eNaturalist, and a, a, a broad web of um, natural historians that know their organisms will tell you about. Let me tell you one more thing is, we are entering, I think, the century of citizen science, where people mm. collect data for natural history. Um, there, I, I, you know, I'm a bird biologist, so I can tell you two examples from bird biology, but you can, there's one thing called Project Feeder Watch, where you look in your feeder, see who's there, immediately put it in the web. Now, now this, does this go back to the Audubon bird counts? I mean, that goes way back, doesn't it? It is of very similar to the Audubon bird counts, except now the results are analyzed and, um, and, and presented to the public almost in real time. You can see the migration of several species as it ah. takes place, as you are gathering the data. Right, so, as you're feeding and, and you're getting... And I think this is really, really important. I think that we are transforming... Natural history mm -hmm. is transforming... Uh, a bunch of citizens that were not particularly interested in science into mm -hmm. scientists. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a really important contribution. So you're saying that we, in a sense, are seeing the, the phoenix of natural history rising from the ashes, that it's coming back. That Did we, it ever I go away? I don't think that it ever went away. And um, some of the most important fields in biology um, are based on discoveries from natural history. Mm. And I can give you two if you well, give me, if you give want me an to. One, one of them is, for example, TAC polymerase which was discovered because a very curious right. microbial biologist. It's in Yellowstone, right? In Yellowstone, right. discovered this uh, microbe that happened to have an enzyme that is very useful to amplify DNA. Mm -hmm. The other one that I love um, is, um, you know, neuroscience is all about how nerves transmit electrical signals. Well, there was this guy that was dissecting uh, a giant squid and discovered these long fires that went from the top of the squid, from the head down to the tail of the thing. There were these enormous neurons that you can use, because they are large, to study nerve transmission. Sure. So both neuroscience and molecular biology are firmly based on natural history. Yeah, getting out in the field, collecting. And we're just beginning to explore the functional diversity of this planet. So I, I think that with our new expanded cyborg senses, <laughs> uh, we are at a very good time to do these things. So if we think of um, human knowledge, this is going to be a taxonomy, right? as science, art, humanities. So just, uh, it's oversimplified, but if we think of it as those three elements, where does natural history fit? Is it science, is it art, is it humanities? Oh, oh that's a wonderful question. Uh, I think that natural history is science. It's, uh, I think okay. natural historians are scientists. They are deeply immersed in their scientific tradition, but they have a lot of care 
about how they present their work. They, they have carrying representation, that sounds pedantic, but they are mm. often, or they mm. used to be often associated with artists. Right. And I think that is Landscape painting, and scientific, back, landscape painting scientific illustration, scientific sure. illustration yeah. and so on and so forth. And also prose. I mean, yes. some of the best natural historians are, were terrific writers. Um, and some uh, of the poets were, were gorgeous describers. Or Goethe of, of, or, yes. or whatever. And um, so that's one, art is one component. And the other one is the history element of natural sure, history. history. And it has two parts, right? One part has to do with, I think that natural historians are very aware, almost obsessed with the cultural context mm -hmm. in which they do science. Mm -hmm. We are very, very aware of that. And uh, that's why we're so obsessed with the names of organisms and things like that. They mean a lot, not only because you recognize a creature, but you have a long history of who found it and so on and right. so forth. And right. the other one is that we are evolutionary biologists. And that's stories. And that, that's history. That's, uh, it's, it's how something came how to something be. Came to be. Well, Carlos, I want to thank you. I think with spring coming, at least there's a few jolts of spring every so often, um, the idea of the citizen scientist is, is, is incredibly valuable. It, it creates a kind of excitement. Whether the person is going out into their garden, is looking forward to some hikes, going fishing, um, we all have an opportunity now to participate in natural history. That's right. I'm dying to see my first Pasque flower. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you, Jeff.